Hello everyone and welcome back to ADAP, our course on advanced object-oriented design and programming. After talking about classes and methods and the design, we will now look at how classes should be organized and programmed to ensure smooth collaboration with each other. And that is the topic of design by contract, a specific method to achieve that. So we'll be talking about the principles, how to express and program such contracts and what to do if these contracts are violated. Design by contract uh, is an approach in which programming classes is viewed as a contracting decision between parties, where the parties are the classes and the objects are the execution of the parties. So you specify the behavior of not just one class, but multiple classes as its instances work together to get something done. And so through its interface, one class promises that its instances will do something, and that is the expected deliverable to someone else and so forth. Simple relationship would be a client and a service. The client calls on the service and expects deliverables returns, and that's specified in the contract, while the service expects the client to do their homework and provide only good arguments. This is all based on the idea that we really, really need to lift our head above the single class and realize how objects collaborate. And hence, as we program classes uh, to give us the behavior for the instances, how we uh, have to think of classes in terms of interacting objects behind different classes. So for example, here in this short diagram, you see a couple of interactions. There's the bookmark class, which has a name object to name a bookmark, a URL, for example. So there's uh, that collaboration and uh, there should be a client perhaps that creates a bookmark, gives it a name and a URL and so forth. So a contract then is these like a real world contract specification of rights and obligations between two or more parties. So we usually simplify here and just have two parties, a client and a service or a client and a contractor and so forth. And these contracts obviously are ideally as precise and exhaustive as is possible, spelling everything out. But that's realistic or under all circumstances, uh, I'll leave that open. But if you can specify and describe the most important things all right, already, you're probably improving over not specifying anything at all and leaving things implicit. It's key to understand that rights and obligations are always, in the case of a two-party contract, on each side. Both the client has obligations and has rights that they expect of the contractor to fulfill. And the contractor or the service interface has rights they expect the client to behave properly for which they will then deliver the promised goods or deliverables. And we will see how that maps on preconditions and postconditions and so forth that you may have heard about in other classes already. So the contract is the relationship, is about the relationship, what's in between these two classes or two parties. And uh, it is important to understand that it is exactly tying these classes together. Since we do not have, again, I mentioned this in previous lectures, since we do not have collaborations or relationships as first class objects in object oriented programming in Java, most notably, um, we have to make do with what we have. And so we represent design by contract as a, re that is a relationship between two or more parties in the interfaces of the respective classes. It would be better to have a separate entity, just the relationship or the contract, but lacking that, we put everything into the interfaces 
Usually we focus on the service interface because often the, the other party is just a client, which is kind of gray, could be any other objects that can, could pick up the client role. So we usually focus on the interface of the service provider, you know, the contractor. So here you can see the insert method from the name class example. And you see actually two methods, uh, the public facing insert method that provides a service to clients and the internal do insert method, which does the actual job of inserting a component C at index I in the homogeneous name object. Now, when you look at the insert method, you can see how there are a couple of assertion methods. Then there's the actual call to the workhorse, but internal protected method do insert. And then there are a few more assertions. So what's happening here is a split of responsibilities in the implementation of this service, the insert method, where the public facing insert method takes care of the contract. I'll explain that in a bit a little more. Takes care of the contract in, in ensuring or asserting that conditions are met. And the actual work is done by a separate method, the hidden or the protected do insert uh, method. For this lecture, I use our own assertion methods. I'll talk later about the assert statement in Java a little bit. You can see here how there are three assertion methods before you even get to do insert and two more after you did the job. So in a contract of two parties, rights and obligations are inverse. The client they have an obligation towards the contractor to provide the materials, to provide the correct argument, to provide a good defined operating environment. In the code on the previous slide, the client has the obligation to pass in only valid arguments, only arguments that make sense. So the index must not be out of bounds and the component must not be null and then the client has fulfilled their obligations. The inverse here is that the client's obligations are the contractor's rights. The contractor has a right to get good data as an input to the service they're supposed to provide. The contractor cannot solve uh, the problem of poor or wrong data, that's up to the client. The contractor can only reject any processing if the input is invalid. So the client has obligations and the contractor expects those to be met or and obviously has to check or else they will not provide the service. That service, then the deliverable, so to speak, is the client's right. They provide a defined context, they provide good arguments, then it is their right and expectation of the contractor or the service to provide them with a proper return result which in turn then is the contractor's obligation. Yeah, so you can see across here, client rights equals contractor obligations and client obligations equals contractor rights for the name method and for two-party design by contract in general. You may have heard about defensive programming in which a method uh, checks everything it could possibly check the problem with defensive programming is that if every method checks everything, there will be a lot of redundant checking. Design by contract and such redundant code is bad. You want minimal code, you want lean code. If you redundantly check uh, for things that can go wrong many times all over the place and then something changes, you will, and the checking code has to change. You may not find all the instances of that checking code of the defensive programming. You'd rather only do it once and know where to fix it if something, if something changed. So design by contract gives you exactly that solution that the checking needs to be done only once at a particular place that is well defined, which is where the contractor or service is called upon by the client in a public method. And so the benefits of design by contract is that it leads to really well-defined interfaces and a clean separation of work because there very clearly is 
Uh, it's very clear who has to do what checking, what is provided to the outside, what is the inside view of providing a service and so forth. And above all, if you do it well, you capture bugs right where they are. So your software simply gets better and more reliable. Oh, and then I ran into this still word. Our goal is to write bug-free software. I pay a $10 bonus for every bug you find and fix. And somehow, rather than being offended, uh, the developers are happy. Why might that be? Well, the developers are in control of writing code and they can introduce as many bugs as they want and they can of course find them quickly as well. So uh, that is the cynical interpretation of what's going on here. The developers will simply solve what they will simply create the problems they solve themselves and in this case um, benefit from a rather poor incentive for higher quality software. You should simply use design by contract and thereby avoid bugs as much as possible because you have really nicely factored code as a consequence of design by contract. So how do you express those contracts? I said something about rights and obligations. How do you express rights? Who gets to check what? And how do you express obligations and so forth? So all of that gets pushed into the service providing uh, class and its interface. Again, because we can't specify contracts uh, as a relationship, we put it into one of the participating classes. And we use the concept of preconditions, class invariants, and postconditions. So precondition is a Boolean test that should hold. Also, if the precondition holds, that Boolean test succeeds upon entry into a method that provides a service. A post condition is a Boolean test that or the post condition holds if the test is true upon exiting a method, so at the end of a method. So preconditions are usually used to check whether incoming parameters are any good, meet the obligations of the client that the client had to fulfill, and post conditions are usually used to check whether the uh, provided result is what was promised and hence that the contract or the service is performing or providing, fulfilling its obligations. These are method level. Um, there's me method level Boolean tests or assertions as we will see in a second. And as such, they are tied to each particular me method at the beginning and at the end. In addition to that, there are class invariants, which are general statements about the class that identify a valid state of an object that is an instance of the class. So class invariants are effectively a constraint specification of the valid state space uh, that instances of a class can be in if they are valid instances. But let's take a look at this more detail. So precondition again is a Boolean condition that should be met upon entry into a method and if successfully met, then the precondition was met. And it serves to guarantee that safe operating environment so that the service can be provided in a good context so that any result actually makes any sense. If a precondition fails, then the method should not be executed. Um, the conditions, the preconditions for proper service provision are not met. And hence, it doesn't even make any sense uh, to perform the method. But even more so, it was the client's obligation to make sure these preconditions are met. So not only should the method, should the service not be executed, the client needs to know they failed to fulfill the obligations. So the client must make sure that the preconditions are met. And if they don't, that's probably a bug in the client somewhere. And again, that is, such preconditions are specific to the service or to the method being called. Here we see the example again. There is for the name class, you can see two preconditions for the insert method. The insert method has two parameters, the index i, where a component is to be added, uh, inserted, and a string c, the component. So now the name class, 
uh, needs to ensure that the index i is actually valid. It falls within the current range of components, so it's not outside that range. And also that the component to be added is actually a component and not null. Uh, so checking for null arguments is a typical precondition if you are not willing to accept null arguments or if they make no sense. So these two bold, uh, bold methods are preconditions expressed as assertions using assertion methods as discussed in a past lecture. So we have assert as valid index and assert as non-null argument and so forth. These are the two uh, preconditions and because they are assertion methods, what happens is they get called. If the assertion is true, they quietly return and work goes on. But if the assertion is not true and the test fails, an exception will be thrown, telling the world or the caller the, valid, the index is not valid or the argument is null, but it shouldn't have been. So these are preconditions. And they take place, of course, before the actual workhorse method do insert is being called. A post condition then is a Boolean condition that is hopefully guaranteed, or that's that's supposed to be guaranteed after the method performed its work and exited successfully. And if a method actually can't get its job done and fails somehow then rather than failing somehow, uh, it should be a failure in post conditions, meaning the post conditions aren't met and to the client it's being communicated could not compute expected result for whatever reason. So given again that we don't have a first class relationship object, but rather just the class where we implement all that, we put the post conditions at the end of this method that provides the service, check for uh, check that they pass and if they pass uh, everything's fine but otherwise we ex have to explain we have got to return to the client and tell them sorry we couldn't do our service but unlike with the preconditions it's now the service's fault most likely some bug in the method and like preconditions post conditions are method specific really post conditions shouldn't happen if you implement the method correctly because where should the bug come from? But of course you never know. So here's how you could, here an example of how you could program post conditions. Uh, first of all, you can see the position of the bold assert statement here. So I, for example, I chose for, a simplest, for example's sake, not a separate assertion method, but a Java assert statement. And it follows after the work was done so that the domain functionality was performed, meaning after the do insert. So the job has been done, but now we want to make sure post conditions are met. So we assert that the result is proper. How to do so without repeating the actual computation? Well, that's up to the quality of the developer. In this case, I just take one particular aspect that makes sense, which is that the number of components increased by one. But of course, that is not a complete uh, test for conformance with the expected behavior but for that you would need a specification and they are not never complete anyway so you selectively you're smart usually if you really write post conditions you smartly select some aspects that you want to test to capture the most common things that could go wrong and so the post condition here is just one one post condition it could be others as well Next to the method or service specific pre and post conditions. Again, we have also class invariants, which are Boolean conditions that hold true for any instance of that class with these class invariants. And so the class invariants, as I mentioned already, are basically a specification of what's a valid state for instances of the classes of the class and if somehow an object's fields, uh, an object's state is outside that valid state space, then somehow the class invariant, then obviously the class invariant have not been maintained. The object is in an invalid state and that 
if that occurs before the method is being called, the service is being provided, or afterwards, then the whole object is invalid and the class invariant has not been maintained. And as a consequence, the service is garbage. Yeah? You can't, can't uh, rely on, on a result from an object that's itself not valid. So um, these are class level components of the contract. And a class invariant should always hold if you're outside the object. If you look at an object, it really should always be in a valid state. Um, unless you are going through some intermittent uh, space uh, trans uh, tra transition in the state space. So during the execution of some functionality, you may be temporarily, while you travel from one valid state to another in uh, an invalid state space, but that should be atomic. That should be, uh, 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 there should be a clo closure around that. So here is class invariance expressed for the name example. And as you can see, they exist uh, at the beginning. They're the first thing in the method and the last thing in the method. It's a separate method. Uh, so I moved the class invariance into their own method because as a class level component, every public facing method of the name class should have those. So you don't want to re redundantly repeat the code for testing for asserting the class invariance. So you move it into its own method assert class invariance and within that you have a garden variety of checks or well not a garden variety a nicely laid out and specified set of checks on whether the object is in a valid state or not example here is a name can never have a negative number of components so the class invariants are tested at the beginning and at the end and hopefully like with any assertion method, the control flow quietly passes through it without any problems. So I just gave you some example glimpses, but how do you really think about consistently implementing design by contract? So let me detail that a little bit more. So first of all, it really is a design level. Well, it's called design by contract. It's a design level element. And so you don't really want to hide it deeply in the code. You want to make it up front center. Ideally, you have the contract itself as a file on the uh, next to the classes. But since we can't really do that, you move it as mentioned into the individual classes. And there in the class interface, or in the interface, Java, regular Java interface, it's right there visible. So you can annotate methods outside any method body uh, with class invariants. Um, so you, you can annotate the class with class invariants and the methods with pre and post conditions. And then it's very explicit and obvious to users of how this class is supposed, instances of this class are supposed to behave. You still have to implement it. Just declaring something doesn't give you an implementation yet. So in Java, you would then use assertion methods or simply for the simpler cases, use the assert statement of Java. We use uh, assertion methods in the implementation of preconditions, postconditions, and class invariants. And really the purpose is that the preconditions guard the entry to a service, the postconditions ensure successful completion and the class invariants hold at the beginning and at the end and ensure that a valid object is given. Assertion methods, as discussed, are really not mutation methods. They should be side effect free. Um, they do possibly reroute the control flow, but they should not change the state of the object. So an assertion method uh, is either the assert statement or a dedicated method if things get more complicated. Things get more complicated if you want to write a longer, if, you have, if your test is more complicated or if it has multiple aspects to it and you want to construct more complex return results, then you can somehow squeeze into a line of an assert statement. So here's the assert is valid index. And of course, the, the, perhaps the most important reason for having an assertion method is that uh, 
it's repeatedly called. So you don't want to redundantly write assert statements, but rather you want to have that one method and have it used and reused. Uh, there are many methods in the name class where you want to test that the client provided, you want to assert that the client provided a valid, valid index. And you can see here the assert is valid index uh, assertion method. It throws an index out of bounds exception if the test fails. So it is specific to what's wrong, what the exception is that's thrown. On the other hand, if the test passes, is if E is larger zero and smaller, uh, is larger than zero or equal to zero and smaller than the upper limit, if everything's fine, uh, you just return quietly. But if not everything's fine, you're outside the limit of uh, limits of the current the index is invalid, you construct the, the uh, return, the information about that and throw that specific exception uh, specific to the assertion failing. And this way you communicate the failure by diverting control flow because an exception has its own control flow and is handled in different ways. And I'll return to that later. So um, in design by contract, it's all in the interface usually of the service class rather than spread between these classes. And you can see how um, usually uh, in design by contract, you check for preconditions being met, you protect yourself against operating in an invalid or unsafe environment. And that's, that's it. The failure of meeting pre or post conditions or violating class invariance this needs to be signaled using ideally a signaled using an appropriate exception rather than just an error of generic error or generic exception and many of the uh, many of the possible failures are always the same you know, null pointer exception illegal state or invalid index exception these really are so common that they already exist so you don't even have to create a new exception. So let's look a little bit in more detail now of what to do or what happens if the contract is violated. Ideally the service is called, the preconditions are met so you pass through the assertions quietly, smoothly, perform your work and return a valid return result based on the input parameters. But something could go wrong and uh, you might not be in that normal uh, situation. So you switch into abnormal operation. The contract was violated, the assertions failed, that is the trigger and you divert control flow into abnormal situation and abnormal control flow by way of throwing an exception in Java and using similar mechanisms in other programming languages. It's really very clear, I would argue, that it's a good idea to separate these two states of control flow, normal and abnormal, and have programming language level handling of these two things and don't mix them like you have to do in C, for example, with specialized error return codes and so forth. So the control flow looks like this. Normal return is performed by return or reaching the end of the method and that indicates a contract fulfilled. Abnormal return is indicated by an exception and uh, that shows the contract was not fulfilled and the other two options should not be considered. What happens then if you throw an exception, so you switch or into abnormal operations, is subject to a later lecture where I focus on error and exception handling in more detail. It's a larger topic, but it fits nicely with design by contract. Looking at that, looking ahead, we know that there are two states you could be in or two behaviors in reaction to uh, switching to abnormal state, meaning something was violated. 
First is the resumption. So you try again. Oh, it's simple as that. Now, sometimes the reasons for failure are spurious or it might make sense to try again because it's not wholly deterministic. Uh, in really safe, secure systems, you might have alternative implementations because you cannot accept the failure to provide the service. Uh, but if none of that works, you will have to uh, actually pass on further the failure. So stop trying to fix it, stop trying to resume and uh, you throw or go into organized panic mode. That's the term for it. So then you clean up the objects as far as you can, repackage any exceptions and throw it on, throw it on up, throw it up further the call chain. Which brings me to the question, should you switch off assertion? So some people sometimes tell me I don't like assertion methods because I want to be able to switch off my assert statements as you can. Should you do so? Yes, no. What do you think? Maybe it's a philosophical question. The arguments for switching them off is usually you don't need them if the problem, uh, if the program has been well programmed enough and they just cost runtime. So people sometimes want to switch it off to gain performance. If there is no performance gain, then there's absolutely no point in, in switching them off. Assertions used for design by contract are well worth the time and effort helping you operate the system more safely. So I would not switch them off. Um, it must be exceptional circumstances that that gain in performance is worth it or your assurances that nothing goes wrong can be believed. So beyond that now, how do we work? What, the, what are the was designed by contract? What are its pragmatics? Um, design by contract, ideally you do it all the time. It should become second nature. Certainly, though, there are places where it makes more sense and places where it makes less sense. It makes more sense if uh, code is frequently used. So there's an 80-20 rule. The most highly used code should be well tested and should be well uh, covered with clear contracts. So look at the places where it needs to be re highly reliable and where it, where the program control flow often passes uh, through. From a pragmatic perspective, the biggest bang for the buck is buck, not bug, buck, is to focus on preconditions, to make sure that the conditions are met for the service, for the method to provide its service. So the preconditions ensure that this is the case and otherwise uh, and so that fulfills both the parts of ensuring the client has fulfilled its oper operations and the services rights are maintained. And then leave it perhaps to the client if you want to keep it short to check up on the results that they are valid. Because that's the same. You could have the post conditions, but why does the method ensure after it did its computation that the result is valid if the client really should check for it. And that's going back to the first table in this lecture. There's the other situation where the contractor's obligations are the client's right and perhaps should be checked by the client. So the service of the contractor uh, ensures its rights by testing or asserting and the client uh, ensures or asserts its rights by testing the results. Post conditions in the method thereby become uh, the obligation of the, of the caller and that makes more sense rather than in the method itself. And in general, class invariance, you rather test for that separately using tests rather than having it in the methods. So by far the biggest bang for the buck, again, is in having preconditions that test the input parameters.
Things get complicated. Well, not so complicated. You just need to know what you're doing. If uh, your code is multi-threaded, this code obviously is not prepared for multi-threaded programming, though later in this course we will see how making the name objects immutable, uh, you solve that problem at once. Here, the multi-threading multi -threading is not considered and hence the assertions could claim things are good while actually things are not. Design by contract also has to face or works well in the face of inheritance. And so you need to understand about how subclasses add or subtract from preconditions or postconditions or the class invariants. So as a precondition, you may weaken, so in a subclass may weaken the preconditions. They accept more varied input, for example. Uh, but then they also have to take care of that. But it's them, it's the subclass who weakens the preconditions and then they should know how to handle it. And that would be equivalent to, say, contravariantly redefining method arguments. The post conditions of a method in a subclass could provide better results uh, uh, than what is guaranteed by the superclass. So the contract really is covariantly uh, redefined here and so um, you deliver a uh, better, better result. Class invariants in general might be uh, more precise and more specific. Um, the subclass invariants may not require less. So you're really, uh, if there's a valid state space defined, defined by the superclass, the subclasses cannot go outside that cannot go outside that valid state space because that would be violating the LSP. Hence, a subclass can have class invariants that specify and thereby um, specify a subspace of the superclass's valid state space. This way you can refine class invariants in a class hierarchy. Here's an example of how preconditions <clears throat> can be um, can be de dealt with in subclasses. A lazy name allows for invalid indices, indexes, and does so by simply expanding in reaction to a, uh, an index uh, that is out of bounds in expanding the size of the of the name. So this is a way of accepting an invalid. So this is a way of accepting an input that for the superclass would be invalid, but that's now valid um, by for the subclass. So you're weakening the requirements um, on the client, the client's obligation. And that's well possible because subclasses can do exactly that. In dual hierarchies, you have uh, covariant uh, redefinition possible of the uh, return type, and uh, that strengthens the uh, post condition of of the of the called of the method of the call of the object of the called <laughs> of the class of the subclass. Finally, a short quiz here. Um, class invariants again are the specification of the valid state of an object. Can you ever be in an invalid state? Of course you can, but then it's a bug. Yes? No? Is it always a bug in the system if an object in between two method calls is in an invalid state, violates the class invariants? What do you think? So it depends on the what method call. And if the two method calls are two public facing methods called by the client, then they are independent of each other. And in between those, the object should be in a valid state. So no, it cannot violate the class invariant. The object can or should not be in an invalid state in between two public facing method calls, because then it would be a bug. But if you call a method 
uh, a public method and of course that internally calls more method then you should view this as a transaction as an atomic transaction this chain of internal method calls and within that transaction of course you can go through invalid states of course temporarily the object can be in some point in the state space that would be by the way of by way of a class invariance considered invalid the key is though that as you end the transaction as you are about to return to the client from the public facing service service method then you need to have cleaned up and you need to be in a valid state again but in between before then you can be temporarily invalid as you perform some computations you naturally have to be in an invalid transitional transi transitory state as you transition in the state space of course but once you finish you should be back to a good state so in this lecture, we talked about design by contract, how to express it. It's a design level construct. Sadly, there's not much support in programming languages. So we looked at how to program it in uh, common programming languages like Java and how to work with assertion methods uh, to identify contract violations. Key is focus on ultimately if you want to keep it lightweight focus on testing preconditions are met at the beginning of a public facing service method ensure ensure the parameters are valid and that is gives you the biggest bang for the buck with that uh, thank you very much for your time and attention once again and see you in the next lecture